we continue our series uh, as we go through this Lenten season called the I Am Statements of Jesus. And you've probably picked up on the fact that in John, Jesus uh, really seven times, we're looking at five of them, uh, says that I am and fill in the blank. And the word I am uh, in Greek is ego a me, but in, in Latin, uh, excuse me, in, in Hebrew is Yahweh. And for a person to even say the word Yahweh was, uh, was, was well, it was uh, grounds for getting in, in a lot of trouble with religious figures of the day. So every time that Jesus says, I am whatever, uh, he's already committed something that could, could get him killed. And throughout the book, he keeps saying it. And today we continue it, that, uh, that series, and we're looking at where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that uh, story is found uh, in John, in John chapter eleven. And John has several unique characters that are not found anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, the woman at the well is one. Nicodemus, uh, the man born blind, uh, and this one here with Lazarus. Now Mary and Martha are found in other places, and there's another person named Lazarus that's not really this same person. But the story of Lazarus as a friend of Jesus is one that is only found in John. And so I would invite us to look together at John chapter 11, verses 21 through 27. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am Yahweh, the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The the story of Lazarus takes up an entire chapter. And I was tempted to read it, but it's way too long. So so let me let me summarize and we'll we'll go from there. Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus is ill. And instead of jumping uh jumping into gear uh, and, and running back to where he lived. He, he takes his time, and, and they, they come back and they say he, uh, he's sleeping. He tells the disciples that he's sleeping. And, and they say, oh, okay, well, if he's asleep, then we're good. And then Jesus says, well, no, that was a, that was a euphemism. Uh, he's dead. And they're like, well, we really need to get to Bethany. And Jesus said, no, we're, we're going to wait here a couple of days. So they waited a couple of days. And then he said, hey, let's, let's go back to Judea. Well, they said, don't we need to go to Bethany, back toward Jerusalem? Uh, Because, I mean, he's dead. And and Jesus said, no, no, let's go. But they said, the last time we went to Judea, they tried to kill you. Not a good plan. Why aren't we doing this? But they did. And so several days later, Jesus and the disciples eventually go go toward uh, Bethany. I get tickled at, 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 I always get uh, tickled at Thomas. He's always the sarcastic one in the group, or the doubtful one. He always has the most odd comments. And when they decide to go to Judea, he goes, well, let's go with him also so we can die with him there. And so off the the disciples go following Jesus to everywhere it seems but where he needs to go. Eventually, he makes it to Bethany. And he's met in the street. Martha hears that he's coming and meets him in the street. And Martha says the same thing the disciples said. Why? Why have you taken so long? If you could have gotten here earlier and, and prayed for him, we know you can heal the sick. You could have healed him, and, and, and he would be alive. And, and then Jesus starts talking to her about the, the words that we saw in Scripture. And she said, he, don't worry, he's, he's going to be alive. Uh, and Don't you believe in the resurrection? And she said, well, yeah, of course I believe in the resurrection. I mean, most Jewish people other than the Sadducees, um, and we'll talk about them in a minute. They, they believe in the resurrection. But Jesus said, no, not, not that resurrection somewhere out there, but here. 
I am Yahweh, God, the resurrection and the life. And, and he who believes in me shall never die. And do you believe that? And she looks at him and says one of the most remarkable well, confessions of faith. Uh, we, we give Peter good credit on his, but really Martha's is stronger. And she says, yes, I believe you're the Messiah. You are the Son of God. Uh, you are the one that has been sent. And, and, and so Martha then is not sure what's going to happen, uh, but she fully trusts that Jesus is capable of doing something. Well, then her other sister Mary, as they get closer to the house, meets him. And, and Mary says the same thing that the disciples said, that Martha said. Well, couldn't you have just come a couple of days earlier? It would have made things a lot easier. And, and she said, he said, just, just wait. And he said, well, take away the stone. And Mary said, no, don't, don't, we don't need to do that. He already, he's already smelling. Now, in the old, the old King James Version, I liked it better. It said, surely he stinketh. Um, now, when we had small children, um, we had three, we had three boys. Uh, we had small children, and they had a dirty diaper. We would just yell to the other parent when they were coming from our room to their room, Lazarus is coming in because uh, surely he stinketh. And um, uh, it was kind of not taking responsibility for changing that diaper, hoping that the other person would. Um, but anyway, uh, he was he was dead. He was dead to the point that well, his flesh was rotting. So what? What do you got? You can't heal him. And instead, Jesus says, "Lazarus, come forth." And Lazarus does, and he's he's in the, the all of the the wrappings and all that stuff, and he's alive. Now, it, you have to keep notice in each of these stories that there are members of the Jewish leadership of the Pharisees and and the council who are watching, and they see that Jesus keeps doing these amazing miracles and keeps calling himself Yahweh, uh, and and they're they're not sure at this point they've not known what to do, but they have a little powwow after this one because they they were all there. I mean, Mary and Martha and Lazarus were well connected with the Jewish leadership, and here they are standing watching. And Jesus has just raised him from the dead. What are you going to do about that? I mean, the word's going to get out. And so they have a little plot that they say, we've got to get rid of Jesus. Uh, we'll, we'll have to figure out a way to kill him. And even as you go into the next chapter, they go, and we've got to get rid of Lazarus too because what are we going to do? I mean, that's evidence that the guy raised somebody from the dead, so we, we need to get rid of him as well. And so there's the story is kind of curious, it makes me ask several questions. And, and the first question that, that I always ask is, why did Jesus wait so long? I mean, wh why did he wait uh, to come? He purposefully went the opposite direction. And Mary and Martha and disciples, everybody that, you know, is kind of logical said, well, what, what's up? But Jesus was... Um, was purposeful in what he did. He wanted, as he prayed in chapter, uh, in, in verses 41 and 42, he says, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I, kn I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. So Jesus raised Lazarus on purpose. He let him die on purpose. And he raised him on purpose so that the people there gathered, the large crowd gathered, the influential people there gathered, could watch and come to the conclusion that, yes, he is the Messiah. Unfortunately, they came, that they said that's a possibility, but that's a dangerous possibility and one that we can't let live. But that is why he waited, so that people could see, so that God could be glorified in the midst of it. Another question I have in this one, and it, I didn't go into the details, but when Mary comes out, she begins weeping, and, and Jesus begins weeping. And there's this sense of, of just sorrow, and it's strange to me, if Jesus knows he's, going to, he's known all the way through, he's going to resurrect him, well, well you know, why, why cry? 
but it's a reflection of of the humanity of Jesus. I have uh, as I've had several roles in life. One uh, as mostly as a pastor, uh, and also as a, a chaplain for a while at Children's Hospital. And um, when you're in the midst of grief, I don't care if you're from the outside, if these people have nothing to do with you, there's something about the human emotion of grief that just takes you, and it's hard to escape it when you're in the midst of it. These were Jesus' good friends, and he was as human as they were. He was also divine. But this reflects on the humanity of Jesus. A third question that I always kind of ask is, well, this is kind of an odd way to put it, but I read an article a few years ago that said, who killed Jesus? And it reflected on all the different people who had a reason to kill Jesus, the, the Pharisees, the, the leaders, uh, the Romans. But the conclusion of the article was that Jesus sort of was planning out the moment when he would be killed he was setting up all the dominoes to fall. And you can see throughout John, he's stirring this pot. He's, he's keeping them agitated. He's, he's making it so they have to do something. Um, my family, my mother's family, uh, was good at stirring the pot. They, they were excellent at that. They were always picking at each other, saying things that they knew would, would cause somebody to trigger uh, as we would use in today's terms, and and they always kept things going. I remember once, uh, well, my, my sister recalled the story to me because I was a little younger. I remembered parts of it, but not the other. Uh, my mom tried to save money back in the 70s, you know, when you had hair this big, and uh, she wanted to give herself a permanent. And so, uh, of course, money was tight, but she could buy it at the store. So she put the chemicals on her hair and left it in too long, and it melted her hair, and it turned orange. And so she had this gloat of hair on her head. And, of course, she was hysterical because she certainly was, was, was concerned about her appearance. And, and so I never knew why Mother had a wig, but I learned that that was why. It was, it was, a, it was a permanent going bad. And so um, the other, other part of that story, well, anyway, so my father, my father picks my sister up from school and says, Lynn Marie, whatever you do, when you see your mother, do not laugh. And she walked in the door, and you know what she did. She started laughing. And of course, that made it all work. And I never knew why she had the wig, but I do remember that around that same time, we went to Six Flags Over Georgia, which was a novelty back then. And they had this ride called the, the Mine Ride. And Mom was on there with a wig. And she hit one of those bumps. And my father's name was Pinky, and I just remember in my mind for, as a child, Pinky, my wig, my wig. And she was trying to grab it and keep it on as they as they went over and over. But my sister could stir the pot. They could all stir the pot. And it felt like Jesus was stirring the pot. He's just trying to keep them on edge because he knew his time was coming. He knew that he had a mission to fulfill. And that mission was ultimately to be killed and to be uh, resurrected. There were people in the audience who didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees believed only in the Torah. And so any talk about resurrection really came later in Scripture. And so that he, he was getting the whole group fired up and arguing with each other. And so the fourth question that comes to my mind when I read this passage is what does it really mean for us? What does it mean that I am the resurrection and life and whoever believes in me shall never die? To live. I uh, watch the, the uh, local news as, as little as possible, but I do watch it occasionally, and I'm always intrigued at how they say, the six o'clock news starts now, and it's just sort of like, wow, this is, this is exciting. Jesus was saying to Martha, resurrected life, eternal life, life of an eternal quality starts now it doesn't have to happen until you're dead but as we are changed by God and we are 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 changed as human beings God makes us into something new God makes us more like Christ 
God makes us more like God, and we start living life in more of an eternal way. And we can see the world from those eyes and not the eyes that we had. But I've also come to know that in order for us to get that kind of eternal life, it's not accidental. For you see, for resurrection to happen, something has to die. There's not a resurrection until there's a death. Now, we've been two or three weeks now into Lent, and um, I'm always intrigued to do the self-study of hip and Lent and see how this whole thing about uh, I'm not going to do this or I'm going to add this, how that progresses. And it, for me, is a, is a time to ask the question of how, how, what's the balance of my life? How's that balance with God's priorities and kingdom, the kingdom priorities? And there are moments, I think, in the time of Lent, a time of self-reflection at any point, where we look at something in our life and we go, you know, that, that needs to die. That needs to stop. I, I need to move away from that. I need to go a different direction. And so I'd like us to close our eyes just a moment and ask you these questions. When is something, a relationship with someone, a job, a tryout that you had at school, what of those have died, but somehow God did something incredible that otherwise would not have happened? When you look back with eternal eyes and you look back at those hard moments when you lost something, you remember the time and realize that perhaps there were moments when that was a good thing and that God was working in the midst of it to bring something beautiful. And how have you dealt with something in life from a this world perspective, but not from the view of eternity? In what situations do you need to start looking at them and, and get out of this pot-stirring moment of this world, look at it from the view of eternity and say, say, I, I need to change how I... I am dealing with this. I need Christ's perspective. I need God's eyes on how to deal with this rather than my human eyes. And then I'd ask what in your life needs to die so that resurrection, the spiritual resurrection, can truly happen.